Have you ever looked at a company's financials and just uh, wondered if you're seeing the real picture? You know, everything that actually happened economically? Yeah, not just the cash that moved, but the underlying stuff. Exactly. Getting that accurate view is just so vital. Mm. So today we're doing a deep dive into something that sounds a bit technical, but is super powerful in accounting, adjusting journal entries. Mm -hmm. This is really your shortcut to understanding how businesses fine tune their reports to show what's really going on. We're kind of building on stuff you might already know. Right, like the basics, transactions, debits, credits, journals, posting. Hmm. Getting that first trial balance out. Yeah, that unadjusted trial balance. Today, we're pushing past that. We're going from that raw, unadjusted list to a properly adjusted one. It's about turning that initial snapshot into the full story, basically. A much clearer financial narrative. Okay, before we really get into the weeds, just a quick reminder, this deep dive draws heavily on material from Far Hot Lectures. Great resource. Absolutely. All the content, the examples, the explanations we're talking about, it's all derived from the comprehensive accounting resources over at farhatlectures.com. So if you're a student, CPA candidate, or even a working professional, it's definitely worth checking out. For sure. Visit the website for extra practice, video lectures, and detailed support on today's topic. And a big thanks to Professor Farhat for this excellent material. Definitely. All right. So let's unpack this. Why? Why do we even need these adjusting entries? What makes them so essential? Well, the thing is, that first unadjusted trial balance, Yeah. it's often incomplete. It doesn't capture everything that financially happened within that specific time period, say a month or a year. Okay. So adjusting entries are basically updates. You make them right at the end of the accounting period. Mm -hmm. Their job is to record revenues that you've earned and expenses you've incurred, but that maybe haven't shown up in the day-to-day -day recording yet. Ah, so it's like catching up on things that happened but weren't logged immediately? Precisely. They bring the books fully up to date for that period. And honestly, this is often where students get a bit uh, tripped up. It's a conceptual leap. I can see that. Yeah. Some textbooks might talk about just two types, deferrals and accruals. But uh, for clarity, we find it helps to break them down into four distinct types. Makes yeah. it easier to grasp. Four types. Okay, what are they? We'll look at prepaid expenses unearned revenue, accrued expenses, and accrued revenue. Breaking it down this way usually clicks better. Right. Four clear categories. Okay, this is where it gets really interesting. Let's dive into each one. Where should we start? Let's start with deferrals. This is the category where cash moves first. Cash first, okay. Yeah. Cash changes hands before the revenue is actually earned or the expenses uh, used up or incurred. Got it. So first up, under deferrals. Let's talk prepaid expenses. This is when a business pays cash up front in advance for something that it's going to use later. Like paying your insurance bill for the whole year in January. Exactly like that. Or prepaid rent, buying supplies in bulk, even buying long-term assets like buildings or equipment technically fits here because you pay up front and then expense their cost over time through depreciation. Okay, so how do you adjust for those? The adjustment is always the same logic. Yeah. You need to show that part of the asset has been used up. So you reduce the asset account, the prepaid one, and you increase an expense account. Debit expense, credit asset. You got it. Debit expense, credit asset. Always. Can we walk through an example? Maybe supplies. That seems common. Perfect example. Yeah. Let's say your starting trial balance shows you have $3,000 in supplies. Aye. That's your asset. But then at the end of the month or year, you go and physically count them. The fun part. Huh, right. And you find there's only $500 worth actually left on the shelf. Okay, so $2,500 worth got used. Exactly. That $2,500 is now an expense for the period. So the adjusting entry is debit supplies expense for $2,500. Increasing the expense. Right. And credit supplies for $2,500. Reducing the asset. Yep. And notice, super important, you've hit both an income statement account, supplies expense, and a balance sheet account, supplies. Ah, right. Every adjustment does that. Every single one. It has to. It's reflecting the economic event's impact on both performance and position. So after adjusting, your balance sheet correctly shows $500 in supplies, and your income statement correctly shows a $2,500 supplies expense for that period. Makes sense. What about another prepaid, like that rent example? Okay, rent. Let's say you pay $12,000 on October 15th for a full year's rent, so $1,000 a month, right? Right. By October 31st, you've used this base for half a month, two weeks. So $500 worth of rent value has been consumed. Exactly. So the adjustment is debit rent expense, $500, okay. and credit prepaid rent, $500. Bringing that prepaid rent asset down from $12,008 to $11,500. Correct. And recognizing the $500 expense in October. Okay. And you mentioned equipment earlier with depreciation. How does that work? It feels a bit different. It is slightly different, but the principle is the same. 
Say you bought equipment for $9,000. You don't expense all $9,000 right away because it lasts a long time. Right, it has a useful life. Exactly, so you spread its cost over that useful life. That spreading is called depreciation. Let's estimate that for this period, the depreciation is $250. Right. The adjustment is debit depreciation expense for $250. Expense going up. And credit. Accumulated depreciation for $250. Accumulated depreciation? What's that? Good question. It's what we call a contra asset account. Think of it as linked directly to the equipment asset, but it has a credit balance, so it reduces the asset's value on the balance sheet. Ah, okay. So it sits right under equipment. Yep. So you show equipment at its cost, $9,000, then subtract accumulated depreciation of $250. That gives you the book value of $8,750. I see. So the adjustment reflects both the expense for the period and the reduction in the asset's carrying value. Precisely. Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. Okay. That covers prepaid expenses. What's the other type of deferral? The other side of the deferral coin is unearned revenue. Unearned revenue. So cash still comes first. Right. But this time, the company receives cash in advance from a customer for services or goods it promises to provide later. Ah, like if I pay for a magazine subscription for a year up front. Perfect example. Right. Or airline tickets bought months ahead, concert tickets, maybe a retainer fee paid to a consultant before they do the work. So the company has the cash, but they haven't actually earned the revenue yet. Exactly. Until they deliver that magazine or provide that flight or perform that service, that cash they received isn't truly revenue. It's an obligation. It's a liability. A liability called unearned revenue. Makes sense. So the adjustment. When they do provide part of the service or deliver the goods, they've now earned some of that revenue. So the adjustment reduces the liability, unearned revenue, and increases actual revenue. Okay, so debit unearned revenue. Correct, lowering the liability. Yeah. And credit service revenue or so sales revenue. Increasing the revenue on the income statement. You got it. Do we have an example for that one too? Yeah, sure. Let's say the books initially show $4,000 in unearned service revenue. During the period, the company actually performs, let's say, one-fourth of the promised services. So they've earned $1,000 of that $4,000. Right. So the adjustment is debit unearned service revenue, $1,000. Liability goes down. And credit service revenue, $1,000. Revenue goes up. So now the liability is correctly shown as $3,000 and $1,000 of earned revenue hits the income statement. Exactly. You've correctly reflected both the remaining obligation and the revenue earned in the period. Okay. Deferrals make sense. Cash first, then the event. Now, let's flip that. You mentioned accruals. What's the story there? Accruals are the opposite. Here, the revenues earned or the expenses incurred first, and the cash changes hands later. Ah, okay. So earn first, get cash later, or incur first, pay later. Precisely. Let's start with accrued revenues. This is revenue that the company has actually earned. They did the work, they delivered the product, but they just haven't recorded it yet. Maybe they haven't billed the client, or the cash simply hasn't come in by the end of the period. Like a consultant finishing a project on the 30th, but not sending the invoice until the 5th of next month. Perfect. Or maybe they just forgot to record a sale that did happen. The point is, the revenue belongs in this period because the work is done now. So you need to accrue it, record it now, even without the cash. How? You need to increase an asset, usually a receivable, like accounts receivable, because someone now owes you money, and you need to increase your revenue. So debit accounts receivable. Yep, showing the asset you're owed. And credit service revenue or sales revenue. Exactly. Recognizing the revenue you earned. Got an example for accrued revenue. Let's use that consultant idea. Say Adam, our example person, did $4,000 worth of consulting work right at the end of October, but hasn't billed it yet. He earned it in October, though. Right. So the adjusting entry is, Debit accounts receivable, $4,000. Asset goes up. If you already had $4,000 in receivables, now it's $8,000. Correct. And credit service revenue, $4,000. Income statement revenue goes up. Okay, that makes sense. You're capturing revenue when it's earned, not just when cash arrives. That's the essence of accrual accounting. Now, the last piece is accrued expenses. The flip side of accrued revenue, I guess. Mm -hmm. Expense incurred first, cash paid later. You nailed it. These are expenses that have happened, been used up, been incurred, but they haven't been paid for or recorded yet by period end. Like salaries for the last few days of the month that won't be paid until the next pay cycle. Exactly. That's a classic example. Or interest expense on a loan that's built up but isn't technically due for payment until next month. I like your earlier analogy about rent. Even if I don't pay my February rent in February, I definitely incurred that expense because I lived there. Right. 
use the service, the housing, so you have the expense and you have a payable, an obligation. Same for businesses. For accrued expenses, the adjustment increases an expense account. It doubles sense. And increases a liability account, usually a payable. Credit liability, like salaries payable or interest payable. So what are the specific examples from the material for accrued expenses? You mentioned salaries. Yep. Let's say the assistant earned $1,000 in salary for the last part of October, but payday isn't until November. The company owes that $1,000. Correct. So the adjustment is debit salaries expense $1,000. If the expense was already $5,000, now it's correctly shown as $6,000 for the period. And credit? Credit salaries, payable $1,000. Now you have a liability on the balance sheet showing that obligation. Okay. And the interest example? Say, as of October 31st, $100 of interest expense has accumulated on a note payable. Okay. It's not due yet, but the expense relates to October because the company had the use of that borrowed money during October. So you need to record it in October. Right. Debit interest expense $100. Expense up. And credit interest payable $100. Liability up. Got it. Wow. Okay. So we've covered the four types: prepaid expenses, unearned revenue, accrued revenue, and accrued expenses. Stepping back, What's the big deal? Why is getting these adjustments right so fundamentally important? What happens if you don't do them? Well, the bottom line is, if you skip these adjustments, your financial statements will simply be wrong. They'll be misleading. How so? Take supplies again. If you don't adjust, you'd report $3,000 in assets when you only have $500. You're overstating assets by $2,500 and understating expenses by the same amount. Exactly. Which makes your profit look artificially higher than it really is. Or think about the unearned revenue. If you don't adjust the thousand dollars you earned, you'd show a liability of four thousand dollars instead of three thousand. Right, okay. overstating liabilities. Yeah, and you'd understate your revenue by a thousand dollars, making performance look worse than it was. It cuts both ways. These aren't just small tweaks; they can significantly distort the picture. So getting these right is critical for accuracy. Absolutely critical. And remember that key takeaway: every single adjusting entry. Hits both the income statement, revenue or expense, and the balance sheet, asset or liability. That link is fundamental. And you mentioned earlier, crucially, these don't involve cash directly, right? Correct. Adjusting entries never involve the cash account itself. They're about recognizing revenues earned and expenses incurred based on timing, not based on cash flow for these specific adjustments. Things like reconciling the bank account handle cash discrepancies separately. Adjustments are about matching revenues and expenses. To the correct period. Okay, so after all these adjustments are made, you end up with that adjusted trial balance. Looking at the full list from our source material, you see cash is unchanged, but accounts receivable went up, supplies went down, prepaid rent went down. Yep, equipment is the same cost, but now we have accumulated depreciation reducing its book value. Liabilities like unearned revenue went down, but new ones like interest payable and salaries payable appeared. And importantly, service revenue is much higher now, reflecting both the earned portion of unearned revenue and the accrued revenue. And expenses like salaries, supplies, rent, and the new depreciation and interest expenses are all recorded. It's a much, much more accurate picture of where the company stands and how it performed. So, connecting this to the bigger accounting cycle, once you have this accurate adjusted trial balance, what's the next step? Where does it lead? This adjusted trial balance is the foundation for the next critical steps. From these final correct balances, businesses prepare closing entries, which zeroes out the temporary accounts like revenues and expenses. Exactly, and most importantly, they use these adjusted balances to generate the actual financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows, and those statements will finally be accurate and reliable because they're based on properly adjusted numbers. Precisely. Without adjustments, those final reports would be flawed, potentially leading to bad decisions by management or investors misjudging the company's health. This really highlights just how essential these adjusting entries are. They're not just bookkeeping details; they're fundamental to honest financial reporting. Those four types really capture the core idea of matching revenues and expenses properly over time. They absolutely do. It ensures you recognize economic activity when it happens, not just when cash moves. As we wrap up, maybe something to think about is how can understanding these adjustments better help you? Whether you're studying, working in finance, or even just reading the financial news, how does knowing about accruals and deferrals let you, you know, 
look deeper into a company's reported numbers. That's a great point. It makes you think more critically about reported profits or assets. Maybe next time you look at your own finances, think about it in accrual terms. What have you earned this month, even if you haven't been paid yet? What bills relate to this month, even if you pay them next month? It definitely changes your perspective. It does. And if you want to dig deeper into adjusting entries or any other accounting topic, don't forget about farhatlectures.com. Loads of practice questions, videos, and support there to really solidify this stuff. Good call. Practice is key with these concepts.